Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Friday, January 24th, we are studying Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. Jesus speaks twice more concerning teachings that his disciples have heard, and with his divine authority, Jesus calls them to the sort of love that can only come from God, their heavenly Father. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Dustin Beck. Pastor Beck serves at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Warda, Texas. Pastor Beck, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Good morning, Pastor Apple. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Fantastic. You're sounding great this morning. Thanks. It's yeah. nice to be in the same room as you. It is. We need we need a fancy name for my studio here. Pastor Wolfmuller has the Tower Studio at oh, St. Paul fantastic. Lutheran, and I don't I don't have a tower. No. So if you think of a studio name here in Smithville, you let me know. I will. All right. So down to business. Matthew chapter 5, 38 through 48. We're here in the Sermon on the Mount. Give us some context that'll help us this morning. Okay. So uh, anytime that we're in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, we have to start from the beginning. And I realize that for your listeners, this is going to be sort of like deja vu all over again, because <clears throat> we always have to go back to the Beatitudes. That's where it starts. That's um, that's the uh, sort of the the keystone um, text to this. This is what gets us into the Sermon on the Mount, and it's what gives us a taste of what Jesus is going to be doing. So I like to think of it uh, a couple of different ways. Um, this is uh, something that I've I've uh, I guess I've been kind of saying for a while is that uh, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, we learn who we are. And then uh, as we get through the middle section, we learn how we are to be, right? So who we are, uh, we are called blessed, right? Uh, Jesus uh, lists off all of these blessings, these uh, these states of blessedness. Um, and each one, uh, you notice, is not something that, uh, that we strive to do, that we... Uh, we we you know bring up about our about our own works or preparations you know I mean um, whoever set out uh, you know started their morning and said today I'm going to mourn right mm -hmm. um, now whoever set out and said today I'm going to be poor in spirit no it's something that actually happens to you it's something that um, that the Lord works in in you and through you right but nevertheless we are called blessed in these things uh, but now we get into this section that is how you are to be how we are to be. We are the pious, sanctified um, people living as salt and light in the world. Uh, you had that just a couple of days ago. So um, I, we're in this middle section here. Um, we're going to get uh, eventually, I mean, uh, as we get towards the end of the uh, Sermon on the Mount, you'll get into the how does that actually work, and we're going to find that it's abiding in God's Word, of course, right? But uh, in this middle section, uh, we have this almost this tension, and it's this tension for us, especially as Lutheran Christians, uh, because we understand um, uh, a particular teaching of the Christian faith, and we call it the distinction between law and gospel, right? That is that um, the law is applied to uh, sinners who are secure in their sins and not fearing for their, uh, for their own damnation. Um, and then we preach the gospel, we proclaim the gospel to people um, who are um, afraid, they're terrified in their conscience, they're they're questioning whether or not they are good enough to go to heaven, which the answer is they're not good enough to go to heaven. And that's why uh, the gospel, the sweet good news of Jesus, um, uh, is, is proclaimed then and there. But we kind of get ourselves into a, um, into a little bit of a fit here because Jesus doesn't really follow the, well, I guess, the way that they taught us in seminary, right? Um, you know, we kind of joke about it and call it the law then gospel approach, um, you know, that the gospel should predominate, that the law would be uh, proclaimed first, and Jesus goes and he starts with the Beatitudes, right? What's up with that? Well, um, I really, this was something that I picked up on a while ago, uh, and, and I think it's really neat, is the fact that um, when we're talking about the law of God, we're talking about his will, right? And so we can't say that the law is a bad thing. Uh, we would do uh, a terrible disservice if we said that, you know, well, we, we don't like the law. The law is, you know, there's a problem with the law. The only problem with the law is us, right? So um, I, I had a seminary professor that once, uh, or a, a college professor, I think you probably had him as well, um, who said that, um, and he got this from Walther. He said, for someone who has received the gospel, all things come to him as a gift, right? Even the law. Right. So that's something to, to wrestle with, because Jesus is absolutely preaching some law at us today. 
right? Um, Jesus is, is going to talk with us about uh, retaliation and revenge, um, and then uh, who exactly is to be the object of our, our love here in this life. But when we're talking about this, um, this law of God, we need to realize that for us Christians, um, while it will always uh, convict us and condemn us and tell us that we're not doing enough, at the same time, it also instructs us in the life of holiness that God has called us to live. Just one more thing, and then we can get in the text, I promise. Uh, I know I'm, I'm, I must have had coffee this morning. You're uh, welcome. Uh, yes, thank you for the coffee. <laughs> Um, the, uh, the way that we understand, uh, or the way that we read the 10 commandments, I think plays into this because this is, this is a neat thing is, you know, um, most of our listeners understand that there are, a, there are several different ways that we can number the 10 commandments, uh, Lutherans, Roman Catholics, uh, we tend to split, uh, coveting into two commandments, but we leave, um, you know, uh, you shall have no other gods as one commandment. Um, our brothers and sisters in Christ um, and a lot of other traditions, the evangelicals, et cetera, um, they tend to have uh, no other gods, no graven images, but then they combine uh, coveting as to just one commandment. But the Jews, who I guess, I mean, got the Ten Commandments before us, um, they actually have a completely different way of numbering the Ten Commandments. There's still 10 of them, uh, but their first commandment is this. This is not going to sound like a commandment to you. It's I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And I think that there's a parallel there with the Sermon on the Mount in that Jesus is going to tell us who he is and who we are, right? Um, he proclaims us to be the blessed ones, and he's the one who gives the blessing. And that's a little backwards because we don't usually think of the first commandment, you know, if it's I am the Lord your God. Well, that's not really a commandment, but that's sort of the the prelude. That's what gives us the basis for the rest of the commandments. And so similarly, to be God's people, to be under the Lord who has brought us out of the out of slavery, out of sin. Um, now, what does it look like to be his people? Well, he tells us in this middle section. I, I appreciate that connection to the Ten Commandments. I, I've never really thought about it, but I think it makes a lot of sense. We've had a couple of guests bring up the fact that here you see Jesus acting much like Moses, not, not exactly the same. The Lord is the one who speaks to Moses. Here Jesus is the Lord speaking, but you, you see some parallels. And so I, I like that drawing the, the comparison between the Ten Commandments and that reminder that in Exodus 20, the ten words do start with that declaration of what the Lord has done. Right. And we see a very similar thing here, too. Additionally, with the Ten Commandments, another parallel we could draw is that the Ten Commandments, as they're given, aren't actually given as imperatives, literal commands that say you must do this, but they are rather what we would call indicatives, declarations. This is simply who you are, which is very similar to what we see Jesus do here with the Beatitudes, blessed are you. And then even after that, you are the salt of the earth. He doesn't say go be the salt of the earth. He says you are that. You are the light of the world. And here's how that's going to work itself out here within the Sermon on the Mount in these various ways where Jesus comes along and says, this is what you've been hearing. This is the teaching you're, you're hearing. Here's what I want you to hear from my divine authority. And so we're going to hear Jesus continue to do that here in Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 38, Jesus continues, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. It's Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48, the text we have for today. So Jesus starts this section, again, with, you have heard that it was said. So what, I mean, we've talked a little about this already, Pastor Beck, but what's, what's Jesus doing here with, you have heard that it was said, I say to you? So much like we're attempting to do here on sharper iron, I think that Jesus is sharpening the focus, right? Um, I, I'll never forget um, when I first got glasses, 
And all of a sudden I could see leaves on the trees. Me too. All of a sudden I could see, uh, I, I could see things that, you know, I hadn't seen in years and it was, it was just amazing. Um, I think that that's what Jesus is doing here is he's bringing things into focus. Um, and he's saying that, you know, sometimes the way that we, um, the way that we have heard the law um, and that notice, notice that's, he's not saying that the law was given imperfectly, but he's saying the way that you heard it. <laughs> uh, might have faltered just a bit. Um, and, and especially over the centuries, you know, um, uh, your guest yesterday was talking about um, the different rabbinical schools of thought and how some of them were a little bit more, um, a little bit more rigid and some of them were a little bit loose. And so um, Jesus is, is giving them the opportunity here to say, listen, you know, I mean, um, no matter what you've heard, here's the way that it was intended to have been heard. Here's the way that it, you ought to have heard these things because we do a really good job sometimes of self-justifying ourselves. Uh, we do a, a really good job of um, finding a way to wiggle out from under uh, the law of God. Um, and so, you know, yesterday uh, you talked about um, about the teaching on divorce. I believe the day before you talked about the teaching um, on uh, on anger, right? Uh, that murder is something that happens, that, uh, that adultery is something that happens first, first of all, in the heart, right? Um, and Jesus brings that back into focus to show us. Uh, and and I, I loved yesterday's show when it's talking about uh, the fact, you know, if, you're, if your right hand causes you to sin, if your right eye causes you to sin, you know, but the problem was never really the eye or the hand, right? Um, and so this is, it's almost kind of a thought experiment to just demonstrate to you and say, listen, you know, think about how life is going to go for you if you cut off your hand, if you cut off your eye. It's not going to fix the problem. Because the problem's deeper than that. And so Jesus really gets to the heart of the issue um, in this section of the Sermon on the Mount when he brings into sharp focus um, exactly what the problem is with us. And when he says, even though you have heard it this way, I say to you. I think there is a sense of amplification in these six series. I, I was thinking about this earlier. You know, we we hear what Jesus says about anger and murder, and that that strikes us. Yeah. And then every time he, he continues on it, it strikes us even harder till you get to these two today. And they, they really, oh, you hear these words and, and you start thinking, really, Jesus, are, are you serious about this? Is this really what, what you, what you meant? And I, I like the way you put it about it. It hits at our self justifying nature. Yeah. We, we would try to use the law as a checklist. Right. Exactly. I, I did that. Yeah, and it's um, you know, it's, maybe it's a little ironic that you've got a couple of Texans in the room today. Uh, whenever we're going to be talking about what could be read as Jesus's take on pacifism, right? Of uh, turning the other cheek, uh, you know, and and down here in Texas, we've uh, we've got all kinds of uh, of of tough folks, and and the idea is kind of built in, you know, you're going to stand up for you and yours. You know, I really intentionally leaned in the yours there, you know, you know, I mean. y'all's y'all's. Yes. You and y'all's. That's that's not what we're going for. All right. Should we get into this? Uh, this first section? Sure. So. So the first section, Jesus says, you've heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And you have a, a fancy, I think it's Latin term for this, this particular thing that Jesus oh, it's is not talking. Mine. Oh, it's not yours. Yeah, I did not come up with this. What, what is, what is, <laughs> what is Jesus talking about here? You, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> fancy Latin, lex talionis, right? Uh, which means. That's how uh, I know that Pastor Beck is smarter than me is because he used Latin and I didn't. You beat me. I, I beat you to it today. <laughs> Go ahead. Next time you can have that one. Uh, lex talionis, uh, the law of retaliation, right? Um, and this is this appears. Um, I mean, it appears in the Old Testament, but it appears even before then. It appears, um, I mean, in ancient Mesopotamian uh, religion and law. And it's uh, you know, I would point out that it actually appears even deeper and, and further back than that. That it's this is kind of innate in us um, since our fall into sin. It's the um, the thing that our kids do whenever they say, you know, it's not fair, right? Um, and I tell him I didn't know that the fair was in town this week, right? No, it's not fair. Um, uh, there's there's a sense of justice, um, or of of at least a, a lack of justice. But you notice again in our self justifying nature that we only really ever point out that lack of justice whenever it would benefit us, right? When we're the ones who are disenfranchised, when we're the ones who are victimized. When we're the ones taking advantage, uh, usually we don't really bring it up. Usually we don't talk about it. But Jesus is talking about it here. Um, Jesus says, you've heard it said, uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Um, this is the way that we want to live our life. This is the way that we um, we want to, um, well, this is just the way that we want to set things right. 
Um, because uh, if somebody has wronged us, we feel like they need to be wronged back, right? Um, as he says, do not resist the one who is evil. I love this. I, I was reading some um, some Luther on this because I have that commentary on my shelf. It's a good one, right? I was reading that, and he essentially basically just says here, don't fight evil with evil, right? I mean, it's it's kind of like, you know, when they used to say, um, you know, uh, uh, don't wrestle or don't argue with an idiot. Isn't that what they used to say? <laughs> Because, probably still say that. Yeah, because either either he'll beat you and you'll be proved worse than an idiot, or you know uh, he's got the experience kind of a deal. Or at, at, at the uh, at, on the other hand, you know if you beat him, what have you accomplished? You know, um, you you got down into the into the mud and you wrestle with somebody, you walk away muddy, right? So don't play that game. Don't be involved uh, with evil. Um, we should never uh, try to play the game that the world plays, um, and I think that that's. Um, that's profoundly difficult, uh, but it's it's also uh, it's also kind of beautiful, right? Uh, that Jesus calls us to be a little bit different, to be a little weird, to stand out. So I, I, to go back to the the law that's sure. laid down, because not only is this probably what we naturally would do anyways, right. but God does write it down within His law. It's given to Moses as part of what the people of Israel were to follow, and so I, I think part of it too. Not only would we want an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. But at least one of the ways that I've heard it explained before, and I think this makes sense, is we would even go beyond that. So you took one of my eyes, I'm going to take both of yours. Right. Right. And and that's the way revenge tends to work, is that it, it escalates. I mean, you think of some of those famous feuds, Hatfields and McCoys. I really have no idea what that's about, but I know it's a feud that's out there. Right. And and eventually you, you get into these feuds and they just grow and grow and grow. And so the, the principle eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as God gives it within his law, is really meant to stop it from growing any further, that this is what the justice would look like. And I, I think I appreciate you bringing up that term justice, because I, I think it, it will be helpful as we dig into what Jesus is saying here. Well, you mentioned earlier the word hyperbole when it comes to the what Jesus is saying about cutting off hands, gouging out eyes. How do we know that he's not engaging in hyperbole here? Is he engaging hyperbole here? So uh, can I have my cake and eat it too, please? Of course. Okay. So I think that he may be a little bit hyperbolic here. Mm. He's going above and beyond, right? Um, and especially when we get into the next couple of verses, you know, um, if somebody is, uh, wants, you know, if somebody's going to sue you and they're going to take your tunic, let them have your cloak as well. So he's speaking a little bit hyperbolic. But at the same time, he's being very serious, right? He's not um, – he, he's being hyperbolic, but he's making a point. Like I said, he's saying don't engage in this evil. Don't engage in this – you know, don't – I mean maybe his his point is don't countersue, right? Somebody sues you for your for your, your cloak. Don't countersue for their house, you know? Um, but yeah, I think that Jesus in a way is being hyperbolic, and this is actually something that – um, you know, people have made fun of Christians. Uh, I mean, in the ancient world, uh, people would, you know, there was um, there was a ruler, I can't remember who it was, Luther references him, but he says that, you know, he used to make fun of Christians for this, and he would use this when he sent in his soldiers um, to basically take everything that a Christian owned, right? And so we're not to understand, that, you know, that this is, you know, well, okay, we're just supposed to, you know, live absolute poverty. We're supposed to absolutely not have anything. Luther does a really neat thing um, in his commentary on this, when he talks about the fact that um, we do have um, a, a spiritual identity as Christians, and yet we do have um, a, a almost kind of a vocational um, identity um, as creature, right? And so he he I mean he uses the term uh, kind of his two realms, but I don't think it's quite the way that we understand it, right? Um, so when he's talking about this, he says that you know as an individual Christian child of God, um, you know your calling is different than that of your calling as a father, your calling as a mother. Uh, Luther makes the point that uh, he says, you know, if, uh, you know, if we read this text, um, literally, if we read this text exactly as it is, um, you know, you know, don't repay evil for evil, right? Don't resist the one who is evil. He makes the, uh, he, he says, you know, if there's a, if there's a woman and uh, a wolf comes and is, uh, you know, in an evil way going to carry off her child, you know, she's not supposed to allow that to happen. We would say, you foolish woman, be a mother to that child, right? Um, and so Jesus is not setting us free from our vocations here. Jesus is not saying that you are not accountable um, to the people 
that God has placed under you. Um, and he says, you know, the same thing goes if, if your station in life is to be, um, you know, a prince or a governor, if your station in life is to be a magistrate, um, you know, if your place in life is to be a soldier, right? Um, he has called you, um, according to that vocation, um, to act the way that that vocation acts. Right. So, and the, he goes, he goes into a whole uh, section there about, um, you know, this is one of the places where he talks about Christians that can serve as soldiers or judges, right. And that they're not, um, breaking this section of the sermon on the Mount. Um, if they hand down, um, just punishments, you know, could you, could you imagine a judge that read this overly literally, you know, well, uh, do not re you know, repay evil for evil. Okay, well, um, then I'm going to proclaim everybody to be not guilty. You know, I'm going to let everybody get off scot-free. Well, that's not exactly what Jesus has in mind here. Right? You, I appreciate you bringing out what Luther has. Pastor Brian Wolfmuller on his program, Cross Defense, here on KFUO, I think it was back around Veterans Day, did a show on that very document about why soldiers, too, can be saved. Yeah. And so I, I would encourage our listeners who, who want to hear more about that to go and, and check that out in the KFUO archives. It's a, it's a great, great program. So... It sounds like we're not we're not saying and Jesus isn't overturning the laws of public society or something like that. He's not relieving, say, the, the government of its responsibility to protect those who are weak, to ensure justice, to uphold peace. But he does have something very and I think this gets overused, but radical to say something that is not what you're going to find in the ways of the world. This is a this is crazy talk from Jesus, at least as our sinful ears would hear it. So what are, I mean, we, we've kind of drawn those, those lines as well, Jesus isn't saying this, but, but what is he saying? What's, what's the, what's the application for us today? How do we do this sort of love that Jesus has given us? Okay. Um, so this is, uh, this is one of my favorite abbreviations on the internet and it's Y M M V. You know what YMMV stands I think you're for? just making that up. I did not just make that up. What What it's, is YMMV? Your mileage may vary. What does that mean, Pastor Beck? So your mileage may vary. You know, I mean, that's that's an expression that means just kind of um, it's going to be different for everybody. Okay. Um, and so and I don't I'm not trying to go in some kind of a, a loosey goosey place where I say that you can make the Bible mean whatever you say, you know, whatever you want it to mean. Um, but this is going to be um, a question that each Christian is going to answer according to their own personal piety. You know, for some people, um, this means that, um, you know, I've, I've talked with individuals before and, you know, not to get uh, off on too far on a tangent here, but we are talking about not resisting evil. Um, I've talked with people before that have said that they will not carry a concealed weapon because of texts like this, because um, they don't want to bring that into the conversation. They don't want to um, be forced to make a decision, um, you know, here and there. Uh, or here or there, whether to, you know, stand up to the evil, uh, but instead they would be willing to turn the cheek, right? Um, you got other people on the other side of the argument, of course, that are saying, but I'm called to be a husband and a father and to protect my family and, you know, my church and everything else, right? So again, your mileage may vary. Uh, there's, a, there's a personal piety that's built into this that says, um, you know, in my life and my experience, um, this is the way that I read this text. And I don't think that Jesus is going to get hung up on whether or not we read this in a literalistic fashion or whether we understand this simply as, um, you know, I do need to check myself when it comes to, um, to retaliation. I do need to check myself when it comes to always seeking that justice. You know, I have to be the right one in the room kind of a deal. Um, because after all, I mean, this entire middle section of the, uh, of the Sermon on the Mount, it's not a, a sermon on salvation, right? It's a sermon on Christian living. It's a sermon on what life looks like to be in Christ. You know, um, uh, one of your previous guests in the last couple of days had talked about the fact um, over and over again that the law is fulfilled in Christ, right, which is wonderful, right? And I would remind the listeners that according to our baptisms and our faith in Jesus, we are in Christ. So the law has already been fulfilled in him, and now we just have the opportunity. We have the, the calling to live in him. Right. So, again, your mileage may vary. Um, this is one of those things where we can use our sanctified common sense. Um, and, and is it is it an easy thing? Uh, is, is it you know, is it is it a simple decision? No. I mean, a lot of us, we're going to wrestle with some of these questions. We're going to say, you know, I don't exactly know um, if I'm doing the right thing or not here. So Christ, forgive me if I'm if I'm stepping out of line.
Jesus isn't laying down what we would call case law here. He's not no, intending yeah, yeah. to put down every single thing you could think of. And we, we made that point earlier with matters of divorce, the anger, all, all everything ahead of time, right? The, the oaths in particular, he's not laying down every single situation a Christian might face. And, and the same is true here. I think, and we're, we're getting close to our break, but I think there's a helpful commentary on what Jesus says here in the apostle Paul in, yeah. in Romans chapter 12, after and, and Paul's doing something very similar there in terms of laying out, you know, it's, it's just a the letter to the Romans is just a wonderful treatise on, on the entirety of the Christian faith. And by Romans chapter 12, he's he's gone through that everyone is condemned under the law. Those who have faith in Christ are saved. And then what is what does life look like as a Christian in Romans 12? And I think that's a, a pretty helpful commentary on what Jesus is saying here and may may give us a few more of those. Again, he's probably not doing case law either, right. but he's still got maybe some, some more things to say on that. Do you want to, you want to go into that pastor back? Yeah, we can go into that right quick. Before sure. We... Yeah, go ahead. Let me flip in my Bible here to Romans 12. He's scrolling I'm to scrolling. his Bible. Yeah. I'm on a it's... digital Bible. Yeah. You can deal with it. I'm a millennial. Right. <laughs> um, so he talks about um, in verse nine and following, he says, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Don't be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Right. Um, he continues on. He he brings up this uh, this idea of over. Uh, do not be overcome by evil, but instead overcome evil with good. And when he when he says that, when Paul says that, of course, in the power and the by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, um, he's bringing us to this place where he um, reiterates what Jesus has sort of said here, which is you can't overcome evil by playing evil's game. Right. Um, you're not going to get there that way, um, because as long as you're holding anger in your heart, as long as you're seeking to set things right by the ways of the world, um, you're playing in the devil's. You're playing on the devil's board game. You know, you're playing his on his board with his pieces um, and he has the deck stacked in his favor. That was a terrible board game <laughs> analogy, but that's OK. Yeah. Um, don't play the devil's game uh, because, um, you know, that's that's in his realm. Right. That's that's where just to bring it back to the term justice that you brought sure. up earlier. Right. How does how does Jesus win justice? How does he accomplish our justification? Not through evil. Right. right. He does it by uh, by allowing evil to overcome exactly. him. He takes on our sins and he takes that punishment. He allows death to devour him uh, only to devour it back three days later. That's right. And that same life is what Christ calls his disciples to here on the Sermon on the Mount. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on Worldwide KFU. We're going to take our break right now, but we'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that many LCMS military personnel and their families are unable to receive word and sacrament ministry due to the lack of LCMS chaplains? Ministry to the Armed Forces is looking for pastors who will answer the call to serve as a chaplain to provide word and sacrament ministry to the men and women who selflessly serve our nation. Find out more about this exciting ministry by contacting me, Chaplain Craig Mueller, at lcmschaps at lcms.org. That is lcmschaps at lcms.org. In Christ, God is writing a comeback story for you. But we don't call it a comeback if it's the same old you who's been here for years. You don't call it a comeback if it's only about getting what you always wanted. You call it a comeback because life in Jesus means the death of the old you. And through faith in Jesus, the real you begins to live. Dr. Michael Ziegler, this week on The Lutheran Hour. Sundays at 1230 and 5 p.m. on Worldwide KFUO. Are you the type of person who loves their community and wants it to be the best it can be? Now it's easier than ever to do your part. Go to RecycleMode.com to see just how easy it is to recycle the right way. Or if you already recycle and want to be as efficient as possible, RecycleMode.com can tell you what should and should not be recycled in your area. Become part of the clean recycling movement today. It's the right thing to do. Sponsored by the Missouri Department of Natural Resources. Epiphany season in the Christian church celebrates the spreading of the story of Jesus. 
Sing for Joy, tells the story in music. Join us. Sundays at noon on KFUO, the messenger of good news. Welcome back to Sharper Iron on this Friday, January 24th. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48 with Pastor Dustin Beck of Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Warda, Texas. Pastor Beck, prior to the break, we've been looking at the first section where Jesus talks about an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. There's maybe a few more things we can say in terms of those practical applications that Jesus gives. But give to the one who begs from you. When I, when I drive into Austin to make a hospital visit or something, you know, how often do we see someone begging? on the side of the road. And I know that that troubles perhaps the consciences of, of many Christians. Does, do we have some application here from Jesus? I think we probably do. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, this section of, of course, I mean, this, uh, this weighs on the conscience of every Christian, um, you know, and, and as you mentioned, you know, anytime that you're in a major city, anytime that you're driving, you see somebody on the side of the road, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Um, it resonates in my ears, maybe not in those specific words, but just the idea that as Christians, we are called to be generous people. We're called to, um, uh, to suffer our own finances for the sake of others. Um, I know uh, the previous congregation that I served, that was something that was, uh, was very frequent was we would have people uh, who would walk up to the church and would, uh, would ask for help, would ask for, uh, for some sort of assistance. You know, and uh, there are, um, you can, uh, as soon as you see somebody in a bad situation like that, of course, you can start imagining up, conjuring up in your head all kinds of good reasons not to help them, right? Uh, which I don't think is the point of what Jesus is saying here, right? Um, as you said earlier, you know, not to use a cliche word, Jesus is calling us to a radical way of life, okay? Uh, but um, Paul talks in Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 3. Um, he talks about the fact that um, uh, he goes so far as to say uh, that, um, and this is while he's um, while he's giving Christians uh, the command to keep away from those who live in idleness um, and, and let each one do his own work in quietness, eating his own bread and not burdening other people. Um, he concludes by saying that if if somebody doesn't work, um, don't let him eat. Right. Um, I found this to be a really, uh, really kind of helpful thing to look at is to say, you know, again, is Jesus being hyperbolic here? Maybe yes, but he's also being serious. Those two things are true at the same time, right? Um, and this is really an invitation to us. Um, and I, I love this, this expression, to fall out of love with stuff. Because our inclination, um, generally speaking, um, to not give, to not help, to not serve, um, is because we believe uh, what the world teaches us is that it's a zero-sum game. So if I give away some of my stuff to somebody else, um, then I don't have that stuff anymore, right? Um, and we are we have stuff, stuff, stuff just at the center of our hearts, um, and there's a, there's a real idolatry that goes on there. Um, so I think Jesus is inviting us to step away from that a little bit. Um, I'll, I'll never forget uh, somebody, uh, when I was a, a, a young, inexperienced pastor, six weeks ago, no, a few, a few years back, uh, somebody had uh, had gone out of their way and they had they'd been very generous uh, to our family. Um, and I just said, you don't, you don't need to do that. Like that's, that's, you know, there's, I can't imagine, you know, uh, why you guys are being this, this generous to us. And he said, well, you know, when you get to be our age, you start to realize that it's a lot more fun to give stuff away than it is to hold on to it. And he said, um, right now we've got stuff to give away and you don't have two pennies to rub together, pastor. He said, you know, there'll come a time in your life when you'll be the one sitting in this chair and there'll be some other young guy coming along and you'll be able to help him. And um, so that was just that always stuck with me as uh, as such a blessing that it is, um, as Jesus apparently said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Mm. Right. So um, there's I think there's something built into that. And again, I don't want to say that everything in, in Scripture is a your mileage may vary type thing. But this is one of those texts where um, whether or not you roll down the window may have a lot to do with whether you feel safe in that situation or whether you have change right then and there, or whether you have some reason to believe that this person is going to, you know, use that, uh, use that money for, uh, for ill purposes. Right. Uh, but again, this is one of those times when you may need to, um, lay aside your selfishness, lay aside your own uh, prejudgments and everything else. And, uh, simply, simply give. 
So Jesus then moves forward. And again, I think there's this sense of ex escalation here. The last one that he he gives with this, you have heard that was said, is is meant to be a climax of sorts. Oh, yeah. to, so he, he says, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. And then he says very famously, I'm saying to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And I think one of the questions that we should answer before we keep digging is when Jesus says, love your enemies. What does he mean by love? Because we hear that in English one way, and I'm not sure it's the way that Jesus intends us to hear it. So what does it mean to love someone, scripturally speaking? Well, I mean, he's going to um, he's going to base this, and he's, the place that we're finally going to wrap up with this is that because this is what God does, right? Remember, this entire Sermon on the Mount is built on the fact that we are God's people. We are called his blessed ones, um, that we are in Christ. Um, and that Christ is the one who fulfills the law, and how does he fulfill the law? By loving, right? By loving God and by loving and serving his neighbor. So when the Bible talks about love, it's talking about the fact that we are called to be those selfless people. We are called um, to um, to suffer um, on behalf of the other, to lay down our lives for each other. That's a big, tough charge, right? But that's the way that God loves us, um, and he has called us as his Christians um, to be Christ to other people. Right. Um, not, does that mean literally you will lay down your life for a stranger? Maybe, maybe not. Right. Most people throughout history have not had that opportunity or have not had that um, uh, that particular or um, well, that calling. Uh, but it's something that happens. Right. Um, yeah. This section is, is really interesting uh, because when he says you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Uh, there's no exact explicit quote in the Old Testament that says love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Right. So this is not something that is is kind of, you know, he's saying Moses said what I say. Um, this is more or less something that's just sort of understood. Um, you have the Old Testament people of God um, who are called to have um, sort of a pious hatred, if that's a thing, a righteous hatred um, of, you know, the Amorites, the, you know, all of the, the Canaanites, the Jebusites, all the ites. Right. Um, back in Exodus, et cetera, um, that God's people are called not to. Uh, participate with them, not to be uh, one with them. Uh, but now Jesus is saying um, things are a little bit different. Things are a little bit different because um, I'm coming to show you a way of love. Um, again, to break that cycle of evil, to to take you away uh, from you know even having evil in your hearts. Is that an easy thing to do? Is that a fun thing to do? Is that something we even want? Probably not, but it's something that we need. I, I think too, when it comes to the scriptural terms, love. Yeah. hate we would associate that with a, a feeling towards someone often right so i'm gonna i'm gonna love i'm gonna feel a certain way towards someone and when i hate them i'm feeling a, a certain way toward them and that's not necessarily what the scriptures would have us think but rather more of how am i going to act toward right. this person so right, my absolutely. love is expressed in what i do my hatred is expressed in what i do toward that person yeah yeah, no, you're absolutely right. We've we've made love uh, just a feeling, and in the words of Boston, it's more than a feeling. Did you see what I did there? That was good. That was good. No, that was not good. <laughs> that was like a dad joke and a pastor joke. Um, so, yeah, there's the action of love, and that's what we've been talking about uh, for this middle section of the Sermon on the Mount is um, how do you act lovingly towards the people that are around you? Um, and so this is this is the one that, you know, uh, maybe, like you said, strikes even a little bit deeper uh, than everything else, because, you know, we all know you're not supposed to um, you're not supposed to murder and be angry. We all know you're not supposed to commit adultery or lust. We all know, you know, that um, that maybe revenge isn't even the way that it's supposed to be. Deep down, each, each one of us feels feels icky whenever we you know, whenever we get our own way and we get that revenge. Uh, but here, the idea that we are supposed to love the people that are unlovable, we're supposed to care for the people um, that want nothing to do with us and we want nothing to do with them. Uh, we're supposed to pray for the people who persecute us, the people that want to kill us, the people that that put Jesus on the cross, right? Jesus is the perfect example of this. As he prays, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing as they're driving the nails into his hands and feet, right? So we are called to live, again, let's use that word, a radical life of love. How great is that? Um, well, I think it's pretty great because it's the life that Jesus has given us. One thing we haven't really looked at, which I think is, is probably worth talking about, is who are these people who are evil, right? Jesus says, do not resist the one who is evil. He says, love your enemies. So who are the evil? Who are the enemies? 
And perhaps is Jesus inviting us to think that eh, we're included in that? We, we tend not to think of ourselves as the evil or the enemies. And, and perhaps Jesus is inviting us to recall, especially when, it, when you, you brought up Jesus and how he's treated us sure. and, and the love of God. Who has he loved? Yeah, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a fun thing to do uh, with a text like the Sermon on the Mount is to take it and to, to kind of try it on the other foot. Right. And uh, instead of saying, you know, um, to whom am I a brother? To whom am I a father? To whom am I a friend? Say, to whom am I an enemy? To whom am I the evil one? Right. Um, and what you actually find is that Jesus sort of fits the bill here because he's perfect. He's he's holy. He's pure. Um, and we are the ones um, who have transgressed. We are the ones on whom he has every right to take vengeance. And yet he doesn't. Right. He forgives. He he goes the extra mile. That's another expression. Right. Um, Jesus is the one who prays for us. Jesus is the one who loves us, even when we were unlovable sinners, even when we still are. Right. Um, what a what a great message. Um, and the fact that we can we can read Jesus into the Sermon on the Mount. Um, you can do the same thing with the Beatitudes, by the way, of saying that he is the blessed one because he is the one uh, who hungers and thirsts for righteousness. He is the one um, who mourns over folks like Lazarus and those who are without a shepherd. You know, um, it's really great that we can read through the scriptures and that we can f see Jesus. I was going to say find Jesus, but we can see Jesus, you know, um, because he's never lost. We can see Jesus right there in the pages of Scripture, right there in, in every verse, um, that this book is actually about that man, right? Uh, but now, as I said before, you know, the law is fulfilled in Christ, and what do you know? We are in Christ. And so being in Christ means being of Christ. It means doing the things that Christ has done. It means that's the calling that he has given us as his Christian disciples. It's the calling that we are to live the rest of our lives in um, at times, uh, it's not easy, but that's why Jesus reminds us that we get to die to ourselves daily. We get to take up our crosses, you know, bring the rope that they're going to hang you with, and we get to go right behind him, right? We get to fall into line after him. Um, what what greater blessing could there be? Because we know where he winds up, right? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Pastor Beck, Jesus says that when you love your enemies, you pray for those who persecute you. He says, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. And, and perhaps especially to our Lutheran ears, this strikes <laughs> us as, as odd or, or even wrong. Are you making yourself a son of your Father who is in heaven? Right. I, I think that that's, uh, that's not a proper understanding of this. If you took these, you know, just these two or three verses um, right here, then you would understand that how do we become Sons of the Father, children of the Father who is in heaven? Well, obviously by loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you. Uh, but that doesn't really jive well with the rest of Scripture. Um, you see, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus simply proclaims us blessed. He simply proclaims us blessed on account of uh, what he does in our lives, uh, what he has uh, called us to be. Um, and then throughout the rest of the text, um, like I said, at the at the onset of the program this day, uh, he has called us to be these things. And so here's how we are to be. Right. We are to be these people now. Um, it, and it's it's actually in the Greek. Uh, you can say so that you may be sons of God, of your father or you can you can kind of read it in, in a way that says and the words genomai. So you're looking at your text there. Right. But it's so that you may appear so that you may be seen so that it, it may be apparent um, that you are. Uh, sons of your father who is in heaven. So the idea there um, is that we are shown to be sons of the father. Um, this is a result of our sonship. It's not the cause, right? Um, and so uh, you ever have this happen with your kids where your your kids will do something and somebody will say, well, he's his, he's his dad's son, you know? Yeah, my kids do that. Sometimes it's when they're poorly behaved, but that's another story for another day. Uh, but yeah, they'll, they'll see, uh, you, you know, your kid will say something or your kid will do something and they'll say, he takes after his old man, right? And that's kind of the way that this this verse is to be understood is that, you know, it's not going to be a surprising thing to everybody when we do things that are kind of Christian, right? Right. I'm, I'm recalling and I'm pulling up my catechism because I always have a hard time when I just have to pull out on nowhere, but hallowed be thy name and Luther's explanation. What does it mean for God's name to be holy? Well, it, it happens when we as the children of God lead holy lives according to God's word. Right. And, and that's, a, that's a great example, that, that God has placed his name upon us in holy baptism. We are his children, and, and so we reflect that, right? I mean, and this, this goes back to what we were saying at the very beginning about the Beatitudes, and, and you are the salt of the earth. You are right. the light of the world. 
Jesus makes us those things. And, and by his spirit, those things do start to show themselves right. in our lives. And when he says we're the, the salt and the light of the world, he means that we're the light that's out there in the world, mm-hmm. right? So that um, in the same way that, um, and I know that you have this happen all the time because your kids are so well behaved, um, that when people see your kids' good behavior, they, they think better of you, right? True. Um, it reflects well of the father, right? Uh, or the mother, you know, not sure, sure not to be sexist here. Uh, but in the, in the same way, um, when Christians do the things that God, that Christ is calling us to do and to be about, um, that reflects not well of us, but it reflects well of the one who called us, the one who made us his, his, uh, his children, right? And so um, that's uh, just to take it back to being salt and light of the world um, is to say that the world sees that light and the world gives thanks to God for it. So we can be thankful about that, too. Just as a side note, I'd like to point out that one of Pastor Beck's own children is here with us and has been very, very quiet. So Live so, adjacent to the studio. That's right. Yes. That's right. So, so yeah, so, so, so well done, Pastor Beck, with, with, with your youngest. Yes, yes, little Hank. Yes, very good. So, so as, as Jesus continues then, I mean, this last verse that we've got here is, is one of those that just, if ever there was, it's like the hammer drops there yeah. at the very end of chapter 5. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Right. What do we do with that, Pastor Beck? Well, so, you know, a few verses back uh, before our our, uh, text today, uh, we had, you know, um, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, Mm -hmm. you know, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. And we were like, okay, well, I mean, they're pretty righteous, you know. Um, Okay, but you're saying there's a chance. And here he says, you, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And um, that puts us in a place where we just uh, kind of wring our hands. We, we, uh, you, our shoulders droop and we just say, um, then who can be saved Lord? Right. Um, that's, that's where this all brings us back to is the idea that um, if you, if you got tripped up along the way, if you weren't following the sermon on the Mount, uh, if you, you were nodding off, we're looking at you, Peter, uh, St. Peter, right? Um, probably. Uh, if you weren't paying attention and you just woke up and you hear Jesus saying all of these things, oh, oh, I got to do this. I got to do that. Okay, I can do this. Okay, I can do that. I'll try really hard, Jesus. But then we get to this point and you just kind of slam on the brakes and say, then who can be saved? Right? Um, you got to hear the whole thing. You got to hear from the beginning up until now. And you got to hear the fact that Jesus is calling us to salvation um, all the way back at the beginning. Uh, in the Beatitudes, um, that he is simply proclaiming these people, these disciples who know Jesus, who are following Jesus, right? Early in his ministry, but nevertheless, um, the disciples of Jesus, he's calling them blessed. And being blessed means being saved, means being perfect. That sounds kind of strange to say, because then he gives us this whole long list of what being perfect looks like, right? Um, And none of us check off any of the boxes on any parts of this. Right. It's like when we ask our confirmation students, right, uh, which of the laws do uh, of the Ten Commandments do we keep perfectly? And the answer is none of them. It has to be. It, it absolutely is. If we're honest with ourselves, um, if we're honest and we read God's word, um, we are broken, rotten, you know, sinners. No good. And uh, so the idea here when he says you must be perfect is that that is true. You must be perfect, um, but you're not perfect by keeping these laws above here. You're perfect by being in Christ, okay? Um, And so he is the one who perfects us um, ultimately in his death and his resurrection. And then finally, uh, when he comes again on the last day. Right now, we live by faith. Then we will live by sight. So right now, we experience this simply as a couple of pastors telling you over the radio. um, And your pastor, of course, on Sundays and and as you read the scriptures as well. Uh, But on the last day, uh, we will know it for sure. We will see it. We, it will be evident to us that we have been made perfect uh, by the blood of the Lamb. Uh, come soon, Lord Jesus. Indeed, indeed. I, I, as, you're, as you're going through with this last verse, it, it's taking me back to what we said near the beginning, that that in Christ, even the law comes to us as a gift. And, and I think you see that in a couple ways here with this with this last verse, that that you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. It's, it's gift to us in that it would drive us back toward the beginning of the sermon on the Mount, right? That we would, we would find our perfection, our holiness, our righteousness in Christ. And then it also does come to us as gift as, as this is the life then in Christ that God has given to us, that he's been describing so far that he'll keep describing for us. Pastor Beck, we've got 
four minutes left here on the morning. Thoughts on that? Further summary for us as we wrap up today. Sure. I think it's a, it's a helpful thing for us to go back to sort of where we started with this idea of the distinction between law and gospel. When we talk about preaching and proclaiming the law, um, we often say, I know that you had a conversation about this uh, yesterday, I believe, where we talk about the three different uses of the law, right? That sometimes the law functions like a curb, uh, kind of to keep us out of our neighbor's yard. Um, you know, to keep us from from just going straight over and doing whatever we feel like, right? There's a societal uh, nature of the law. Um, the second use, uh, as Lutherans understand it, is the theological use, the the mirror that shows us our sin and reminds us that how much we need a savior, right? And then the third use is is sort of for Christians only. It's the guide that shows us what love looks like. It's important to remember here that we are not the ones who get to use the law right? The Holy Spirit uses the law. And so the Holy Spirit, he is going to use the law as he sees fit. So some days you will read this text or it will come to your mind um, and and it will just, it will speak out to you. The Holy Spirit will, and uh, you will be generous to somebody um, that otherwise you wouldn't have been generous to. Uh, some days um, the Holy Spirit will, uh, will come to you uh, and will speak to you after you have taken that retaliatory uh, uh, measure and after you have hurt somebody worse than they hurt you seeking your own brand of justice um, and it will cut you to the heart right it'll cut you to the core and you'll say wow i really broke something i really ruined something there um, and other days uh you know it, it will just sort of be there um reminding you this is what love looks like um this is not the way of christ i need to go that way i need to do this i need to do that um, but the point that i'm trying to make here is to say that um, the Holy Spirit is going to use these words in your life. And that's why it's such a great idea to be in Bible study, such a great idea to listen to shows like this, um, is because the more that you listen, the more that you're in God's word, the more God's word gets into you, right? And so the Holy Spirit uh, will recall uh, verses like these. He'll recall uh, times like this and, and will bring this back to your memory in those situations where you have the opportunity to hate your neighbor and instead you'll be a loving person. And you'll be surprised about it afterwards. You'll say, I don't even know why it was that way. You know, I don't like that person. I don't want to be around that person. Um, and, and then I, I, my prayer for you is that you would look back on the, that moment afterwards and you'd say, thanks be to God for that, right? Because the amazing thing about being a Christian is that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, right? That we are in Christ. Um, that it, I'm kind of almost making it a Russian doll thing, and I'm not trying to, right? That the fact that Jesus lives in us, the Holy Spirit dwells within us, um, that he directs our steps and our, 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 our pathway. So are there times when we're going to mess up? Are there times when we're going to sin? Absolutely, right? That's one of the, uh, the joyful paradoxes of being a Lutheran um, is to say that we are simultaneously 100% saint, 100% sinner. Right? We're both those things at once. And um, so there are times when we can look and we can say, gosh, I hope that was the, the little saint acting inside of me. I hope that was uh, done to the glory of God and not to my own selfish, uh, selfish desire and selfish fulfillment. Um, but nevertheless, dear Christians, uh, you may rejoice. You may find hope in the fact that just as Jesus has proclaimed you blessed, so also does he proclaim you perfect uh, by the blood of his cross, by his death, by his rest in the tomb, by his resurrection. And one day, You'll know it for sure by his return. Pastor Dustin Beck is the pastor at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Warda, Texas, helping us this morning with Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. Pastor Beck, thanks for coming over to Smithville today. Sure thing. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again next week.